coffee. Coffee now! <laughs> There shall be signs in the sun, and in the moon, and in the stars, and upon the earth, distress of nations, with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. One man, one microphone, one mission. One message. True News, the only newscast reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. And now for the most powerful hour on radio, here is End Time Newsman, Rick Wiles. This is True News, the news program that reports the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. So help us God. I'm Rick Wiles. Welcome to one hour of Uncensored News views and commentary. Retired private banker Marilyn Barnwall will join me in a few minutes to discuss the coming bank bail-ins. Later in the program, author Jim Fletcher will discuss Pastor Rob Bell's heresy that denies the existence of hell. First, I need to make two quick announcements. This month has gone by so fast, I didn't realize we're at the end of October. And if you listen to True News on WWCR, World Band Shortwave Radio, at 6 p.m. Eastern, we will be on new frequencies starting Monday. The new frequencies are 6115 and 5070. Again, 6115 and 5070. This is for WWCR, World Band International Shortwave Radio, the broadcast at 6 p.m. Eastern Time. The second important announcement is that True News needs a big outpouring of financial support in the next week. Now, I ordinarily don't look at our financial books. I rely on Pastor Chris Steinle to take care of the finances and to pay the bills. And if I don't hear anything from Pastor Chris, I assume everything is peachy and rosy and happy over there in his department. But he informed me today Uh, that donations to True News for October are far below normal levels. Now, I'm not worried about it because I've seen the Spirit of the Lord move at the last minute many times over 15 years of broadcasting. God has never failed us, not once. So next Thursday is the last day of October. That gives the Lord a whole week to pull off a great miracle. And I'll be praising him and giving him glory and honor. And I'm asking everybody who relies on True News to make an extra effort in the next week to send a gift to True News by the end of October. All will be well with us and all will go well for you when you give generously to the work of the Lord. Let's take a quick look at the headlines before retired private banker Marilyn Barnwall joins the program to talk about the bank bail-ins that are on the horizon for Europe and Canada and the United States. A tally from uh, top secret NSA documents obtained by various news sources reveal that the NSA spy agency recorded information from more than 124 billion telephone calls during a single 30-day period earlier this year. The documents show that the NSA's boundless informant program is global, and the amount of communications that the U.S. government is collecting and monitoring is staggering. According to the London Guardian, boundless informant allows users at the NSA to select any country on a map and view the data volume and select details about the collections against that country. Again, NSA documents revealing that the NSA recorded 124 billion telephone calls during a 30-day period this year. Anger against American surveillance operations is spreading throughout Europe and Latin America. Germany took the unprecedented step of ordering U.S. Ambassador John Emerson to meet face-to-face with German Foreign Minister Guido Vestavella uh, to explain why the U.S. government has been eavesdropping on the private telephone calls of Chancellor Angela Merkel. Uh, Germany's uh, defense minister, Thomas de Maizière, said European leaders could not simply return to business as usual with the United States, 
Sources in Berlin said Mrs. Merkel was livid after being informed by her security agencies that the U.S. was spying on her mobile phone calls. She called President Obama on Wednesday to rebuke him. In Colorado Springs, the U.S. Air Force Academy may drop the phrase, So Help Me God, from its honor oath after Jewish atheist Mikey Weinstein's Military Religious Freedom Foundation has filed a complaint. U.S. Army Secretary John McHugh ordered military commanders to halt all on-base briefings about domestic extremist organizations that labeled evangelical Christian ministries as domestic hate groups. Fox News had reported last week about a briefing at Camp Shelby in Mississippi that labeled the American Family Association as a hate group. Secretary McHugh's memo orders base commanders to halt all briefings and training seminars about domestic extremists until the course materials have been evaluated. You'd think they would have done that before they started. Fort Hood soldiers were warned last week that participating in or donating money to evangelical Christian groups or the Tea Party could result in military punishment. Now, if you think the banking crisis of 2008 is over, think again. Another wave is on the horizon, perhaps cresting in 2015, 2016. Last Sunday, Reuters reported that European leaders are working to put together into place the mechanism for bank bail-ins in Europe. The bail-in rules should be in place by 2016, but Germany wants the bank bail-in rules to start in 2015. Here in the USA, precious metals expert and financial analyst Jim Sinclair is warning his subscribers that bank bail-ins are coming to America. He's warning that the same banks that got bailed out by the U.S. government in 2008 will get bailed in by their depositors in the next wave of bank failures. By the way, Mr. Sinclair is the son of one of the Wall Street traders who founded Goldman Sachs. Are bank bail-ins a foregone conclusion? Is there a way to protect yourself? Are there alternatives to the present system of banking that dominates Western nations? My guest today is Marilyn McGruder Barnwall. She started her career in 1956 as a journalist with a Wyoming Eagle newspaper in Cheyenne. She wrote extensively for the American Banker Magazine, Bank Marketing Magazine, Trust Marketing Magazine, and was the U.S. Consulting Editor for Private Banker International. She is the retired president of the Magruder Group, and she continues to write these days under the blog MarilynWrites.blogspot.com. Mrs. Barnwalt, welcome to True News. Well, thank you very much. Well, did you spend most of your career in Wyoming? No, actually, uh, just the first couple of years as a, an investigative journalist, and then I had an opportunity to become a banker, which I did. And after uh, 10 years in Denver's largest commercial bank, where I became their first female vice president uh, in charge of major deposit and loan portfolios, I didn't like the way banks did business, and I had created the world's first private bank in the United States, and uh, so I left and became a consultant, started my own company, and it went global. So, Really? Now, a, a lot of people don't know what you mean by a private bank. I, I do, but, but take a moment and explain to our listeners, what is a private bank? Well, you're right. A lot of people use the term private bank when they're referring to a central bank, for example. That's not what this is. A private bank is literally a bank within a bank, and and there are two kinds of them. One is traditional, and that is it manages existing wealth. The kind of private banking I created creates wealth, and it helps establish, uh, sustain, and push forward a strong middle class. And that's what I saw in banking that I didn't like. The way loan policies were established were a bit anti-middle class, independent business, and so on. And, and I watched for so many years Citibank driving past a lot of good loans to independent businesses in America so they could go to a foreign country and make a bad loan, and, and it bothered me. And so I left the established walls of banking and 
have kind of been in 180 degrees opposing position uh, ever since. Okay. When and where did banking in the U.S. go wrong? Oh, that well, it it has been going wrong for a long time. <clears throat> but the biggest thing that happened was in 1999 when uh, the Graham Bliley Graham Leach Bliley Act was passed and removed the Glass Steagall Act and the protections of the Glass Steagall Act. The Glass Steagall Act prevented. Uh, J.P. Morgan from joining with Chase. Uh, It prevented brokers and brokerage services from being provided by banks, and it prevented brokers from offering banking services. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And that got changed in 99 with the the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. Uh, Marilyn, when, when I started my career, I was in advertising uh, mm-hmm. sales manager, uh, you know, local radio and newspaper television. But, you know, this is, you know, I'm talking about in the 70s, early 80s. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, in those days, uh, you know, it was common in any uh, American city. Uh, you know, the banks were, were locally owned. And, okay. you know, and I remember, you know, my, my clients were the were the banks, and I, I could just walk into all the banks that were in the, you know, they were all downtown because you didn't have malls at the time. But you could just walk into the various banks, and I would meet with the bank presidents, and uh, we would do business. But today, the, the, there are no bank presidents there. They're just branch managers because they yeah. all work for some mega bank that's, you know, in New York City. Well, and, and that is the result of the second most important piece of legislation. See, Glass-Steagall was put through after the Great Depression. That was put in place in 1933. So, too, was an act called the McFadden Act, which prevented interstate branch banking. Oh, and he was a fiery congressman. Oh, he was. Oh, he, 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 he knew who and what the Federal Reserve was. That's right. He did, and they tried to kill him a few times, and Actually, the rumors are that they they, they succeeded. succeeded. They succeeded, yeah. yes. Yeah. So, but the, so, but interestingly, by the way, Rick, McFadden was never removed from the books. It, that decision was not made by Congress. It was made by the Comptroller of the Currency, and the Comptroller of the Currency does not have the authority nor the power to change a congressional law legislation what's your thoughts about the u.s federal reserve system the u.s federal reserve system is in my opinion nothing more than a wholesaler a middleman uh that really does nothing and gets paid very well for it basically tell me see the, the federal reserve system is totally unlawful in the beginning in on december 23rd 1913, they came through and passed legislation saying that we're going to have the Federal Reserve take over things. Article 8 of Section 1 of the Constitution of the United States gives that authority and responsibility to the Congress. You cannot change the Constitution by passing a a law in Congress. You have to pass an initiative, send that initiative to every state, and let the people vote on whether they want to amend the Constitution. They never did that. That's right. Senator Nelson Aldridge, was, he was in the uh, pocket of the Rockefellers. and Well, he and, was part of the Rockefeller family, actually. That's right. But, that's right. Yeah, that's that's right. right. And they, they had their secret meeting in Georgia uh, yep. on, on uh, Jekyll Island. Right. And uh, we got the creature. We got the creature, that's right. We got that's the creature right. from Jekyll Island. Well, and I mean, really, what does the Federal Reserve do? What does it do? The Treasury Department decides it needs more money. The Fed doesn't decide that. They can't create money. The Treasury does. Treasury goes to the Federal Reserve and says, we need money. And so the Fed goes to J.P. Morgan Chase and Goldman and all the brokerage firms that sell are, you know, bonds, treasury bonds, 
and they say, here, sell these treasury bonds, they get paid a commission for that. The brokers get paid a commission for selling, and that's it. And the other thing that the Federal Reserve is responsible for is our monetary policy, Rick. Marilyn, uh, the Barney Frank, uh, the Frank Dodd Law. Dodd Frank Law. Yeah, yeah, that's really important. Yeah, instead instead of uh, using the financial crisis of two thousand eight to to get rid of the Federal Reserve, they, they passed a law that that made the Federal Reserve more powerful, put them in charge of 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 auditing and regulating the entire banking system. Well, Dodd Frank did worse than that. I'll tell you the the. What Dodd Frank has done, and the, and part of it doesn't go into effect until January first, two thousand fourteen, is that it declares bank depositors—that's you and me—if you've got a checking account—that it declares us as unsecured creditors of the bank, and that's <clears throat> you need if you have not read that part of Dodd Frank, you need to do so because that is how. They will do bail-ins, as you were describing. There we go. And, you just and, and. We just brought this full circle. That's right. We just brought and, it full circle. So the Dodd-Frank portion that sets the stage for bail-ins in the United States kicks in January 1st, 2014. Sure, because it, as of that date, depositors in banks are no longer depositors. They are unsecured creditors. And what that means, if you really get down to the nub of defining it, is that we uh, we are the the bank owns your deposits. I guess there's no Mm -hmm. simpler way to say it. You do not own your deposits anymore. The bank has lawful title to them. They literally will own. Starting January first, the bank will literally own the money that you put in the bank. That's right. That's right. They will have legal ownership of the money. That's right. In other words, if your bank makes a bad, some bad investment decisions, and and it's going to go bad, everybody gets paid ahead of you. That includes uh, the absolutely useless and worthless derivatives. If they've invested in those, the people, everybody gets paid ahead of the depositor, and they can use depositor funds to do that. Uh, Marilyn, do you know if if this Dodd-Frank rule applies to credit unions? Yes, it does. The uh, federal credit unions now function under the auspices of the Federal Reserve System. So they brought them under the umbrella with the Dodd-Frank Act? Yep, they sure did. Well, that that actually came out in a separate piece of legislation, but it is supported by by Dodd-Frank. I mean, they now, anything that, that deals with money now falls under the auspices of the Fed, the FDIC, the Office of the Comptroller of the Currency. And one of the most, probably the most important thing that people could be doing today is working to establish a state bank system. And we only have one state-owned bank in the United States, and that's in North Dakota. And it's 94 years old, and it they have had no bank closures in the state of North Dakota because of the state bank. And they are number one economically year after year. And it doesn't just have to do with the Bakken oil fields like everybody thinks. <clears throat> Basically, their state bank. And, that, and that, bank, that bank was uh, the product of uh, just... Uh it was just uh, old-fashioned prairie populism. That's right. Uh, and and uh, the people said, we're going to start our own bank. The people said, we don't want anything to do with Wall Street after the 1913 establishment of the Federal Reserve System. And they opted out. They said, we want our own state bank. <clears throat> Marilyn, how, how do you, how, if, 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 if all 50 states started a state bank in today's climate, under the Obamanista revolution, how do you prevent a state bank from becoming a socialist state bank? You've got to be very careful, and boy, what a good point. What a good question, because there is a group of, with a socialist bent, shall we say, that has some Soros money behind it that promotes state banks very strongly. 
but the way they're promoting them, they want to bring the fractional reserve banking concept to the state bank system, and that would destroy it and actually would kill the, the last thing that we have that can save us. Because what, what a state banking system would do would be to cut off the head of that snake. It would prevent your state taxes and your state fees from being fed into the Federal Reserve System. Because in North right. Dakota, all the state taxes, and I assume county taxes also, they're, yep. all, they're all deposited in the one bank that's owned by the people of North Dakota. That's right. That's and it, exactly the, money right. Never, the money never leaves the state. That's right. And they use that money to promote the economy of that state. And there have been a lot of studies done on this, and the estimates are that it takes one year to be able to totally turn around a state's economy simply by taking control of the money and keeping it out of the money center banks, who yeah, because that's where it goes. That, that's the difference in North Dakota and the rest of the country. Their money stays in the state, and it promotes agriculture, it promotes uh, technology, and things that are decided within the state of North Dakota, rather than being put in the system. And once you put money in Wells Fargo, well, their corporate headquarters is San Francisco, so it goes there. Or Bank of America, hmm, their corporate headquarters is Charlotte, North Carolina, so it goes there. Or Citibank in New York. Once the money leaves the state, it's going to go to the state to help build the state that has the largest voting block of whatever political party is in power at the time. So if we have a state bank, the two challenges will be, one, keep the money out of the hands of the international banksters, and two, Absolutely. keep the hands, keep the money out of the hands of the socialists. The banksters will spend the money on themselves, and the socialists will spend the money on all of their uh, political supporters. That's right. And in fact, uh, I will be glad to send you, I've written the legislation for the Colorado State Bank, which we're working very hard to get on, uh, and I'll be glad to send you a copy of what the legislation has to be to protect the people from having a socialist system implemented. The state bank literally does no little, very little, uh, contact with the public. The independent banks in North Dakota are still as independent as any bank anywhere else. It's just the state bank that acts as a uh, an administrator, as a correspondent bank uh, for the system. The thing about it is this. If a, if a state wants or needs to declare sovereignty and has to establish its own currency, the only way you can do that is is with a state bank. You can't do it without a state bank. It's interesting. And, and I'm sitting here looking you know, at the calendar, the Dodd-Frank provision making all bank deposits uh, the unsecured uh, or, 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 the credit, or the the depositors will be unsecured creditors of the bank. Right. This right. goes into effect in two months. That's right. Not two years, two months. Yeah. That which tells you it, banks aren't the best place in the world to have your money. Well, where do people put their money right now? What do they do Boy, in the next two months? Good question. You know, I used to do, I, I, I mean, I used to invest and thought one of the best investments you could do because it was a very moral investment. Uh, it helped people have time to pay their, their property taxes or things that they had gotten behind on in this economy. And now I won't even put my money there because, uh, I mean, that was the safest, one of the safest investments you could make. certain amount of it's got to be in precious metals, um, a certain amount of it. I just yesterday invested for the first time in palladium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I did not realize that you could get Canadian maple leaves in palladium. Uh, and I, because the gold and the silver market they're being so badly manipulated. Yes. You know? That's right. And, and, and the government has, the federal government has uh, worked tirelessly to shut off the, the, the doors, the gates to the offshore banking world. 
they're making it extremely painful for the average American citizen to to move their money offshore. Yeah, I mean, now to have an offshore uh, entity and bank accounts, you have to have expensive lawyers advising you in order to stay out of prison. Yep. Yep. I, I, it is. Uh, they are really backing people into a corner with the remaining portions of Dodd Frank that will be implemented on January one, two thousand fourteen. It's frightening. Do, do and, you and, do you see a banking crisis up ahead? Absolutely. When? Absolutely. When? And, uh, and see, I see it happening much sooner than most people. I believe. I believe sometime because we are out of money. We are out of money. There is no money there. I think what's going to happen is one night people are going to go to bed and they have $10,000 in the bank and they're going to wake up the next morning and they're going to hear an announcement that a new currency has been issued and they have a month to go cash, you know, get their old uh, currency uh, changed into the new currency and, oh, by the way, you'll only have 5000 because instead of 10000 because the currency's been depreciated. I do too. That's how fast it's going to happen. I do. When, do you see a wave of bank failures coming? Um, I, yeah, I do, actually. Mm-hmm. There have already been a, there's already been a huge wave of bank failures when you look at the number of independent banks. And, and what I think is even more insidious is this. The, the independent banks, which are the ones that are being taken over by the larger banks, that's the group of banks that most strongly supports the middle class and independent business in the United States. This is a direct attack on the middle class. Absolutely. They want an oligarchy, and boy, they're going after it. The government is using our tax money to to prop up the biggest banks that should fail. And they're using our money to prop them up so that they can now buy up and gobble up the the locally owned and regionally owned banks. That's right. Well, <clears throat> and it's, it's worse than that. But actually, that has a glimmer of light in it, by the way, Rick. The, uh, when you... I don't know exactly how to explain this. It's called odious debt or immoral debt. Mm -hmm. And the Congress passed an act called the Jubilee Act, which, by the way, is on my uh, uh, webpage at marylandwrites.blogspot.com. But I'll be glad to send you a copy of it to post for your listeners if you like. But this gets into the forgiveness of debt that is created unconstitutionally that's getting now, interesting because i've been saying for years there's going to be a debt jubilee that's right oh wow that is prescient because i'll tell you what that is exactly what needs to happen and, and it's being done and we have two well we have numerous precedents where it has been done and guess where the major precedent comes from george w bush when we invaded Iraq and the European banks had been trading uh, against United Nations uh, uh, things that were supposed to prevent them from trading, and they had debt in Iraq, and the European banks insisted that we repay that debt, that they, the money they lost. And George W. Bush refused to pay it, said it was immoral odious debt. There's a precedent. Then in uh, 2008, the president of Ecuador said, we are not paying any debt that is unconstitutional because it is immoral debt. Well, let me tell you what, if you look at the American debt structure, if you look at it, we could reduce our debt today by somewhere between 8 and $12 trillion, because that's how much of it is immoral debt. It's unconstitutional. Show me in the Constitution where anybody, including the Federal Reserve System, which is an unlawful organization to begin with, 
has the right to send $85 billion, uh, put it on the backs of the American taxpayers so Goldman Sachs can pay large bonuses to its president and, and staff. The Federal Reserve is carrying out the, uh, the biggest bank heist in world history. And, well, I mean, yeah, and, I and they're getting ready. They're getting ready to clean out the whole shebang pretty soon. They got one more really big robbery up ahead, and that's the total wealth of the middle class. And they're they're, right. they're getting positioned for that grab, and that's, and it's up ahead. Right. I totally agree with you, and that's what all of these unlawful foreclosures are about. They, uh, it's it's an assault against the middle class of the United States. That's right. Marilyn, we're out of time. I'm going to have you back on because we're just starting, uh, we're just getting started on this, and I, I really want to go deeper on this subject of a debt jubilee. So we'll, we'll have you back uh, in the future to pick up this conversation. My my guest, uh, retired private banker, uh, Marilyn Magruder Barnwall, and her blog is marilynwrites.blogspot.com. Thank you, Marilyn. My pleasure. Reporting the countdown to the second coming of Jesus Christ. This is True News. This is Max McLean. What is the appropriate response to God's saving grace? Listen to the Bible from Romans chapter 12. Therefore I urge you, brothers, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God, This is your spiritual act of worship. Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good, pleasing, and perfect will. From Romans 12. Listen to the Bible. It's great for the soul. The Bible says that faith comes by hearing. Be able to hear the Word of God today and every day. To hear more, go to RadioBible.org. That's RadioBible.org. Welcome back to True News. I'm Rick Wiles. Several years ago, Mars Hill Bible Church pastor Rob Bell gained notoriety when he published a book titled Love Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the fate of every person who ever lived. Pastor Bell is described as one of the new breeds of young evangelical Christian leaders. The truth is, Mr. Bell is nothing more than one of the old breed of heretics. In Love Wins, Pastor Bell disputes the belief in a literal hell. He argues that a loving God would not sentence sinners to eternal damnation forever. The book was embraced by numerous neo-evangelicals, as the treatise of a new version of Christianity, kinder, gentler, and more inclusive than that old-time religion that warned of hellfire and brimstone for those who reject the salvation of Jesus Christ. Bible prophecy author and speaker Jim Fletcher has responded to Mr. Bell's book with his own version. It is titled Truth Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the dangerous theology of Rob Bell, Mr. Fletcher is the founder and president of Prophecy Matters. The website is prophecymatters.com. This is his first time on True News. Jim Fletcher, welcome to the program. Hi, right, thanks, Rick. Nice to be with you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to, you know, for the benefit of the record, I never read Rob Bell's progr- uh, book simply because I have no interest in reading heresies. And I mean, you know, it, once I knew what was in the book, I didn't want to stick any of that stuff in my mind. Why waste time and money reading the book uh, just to, you know, to know that uh, here's another heretic, uh, you know, passing on uh, a false teaching. But I appreciate the fact that you did read it and you've analyzed it and you've responded in in a biblical way using Scripture to – uh, refute the false teachings that's in that book. So let, let's start first by uh, itemizing the false doctrines that Pastor Rob Bell presents in his book, Love Wins. 
Well, sure, and, and as a matter of fact, I uh, agree with you uh, about uh, your reason for not reading the book. Uh, I think with someone like Bell, you can read reviews, you can read other articles and get a, a sense of what's in it. Um, the important thing to remember, though, with his style of communication is that he engages in what I call double speak. He will say that he's not a universalist, and yet he'll write a book, and clearly that's his message. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to pin these guys down uh, on on where they exactly are uh, with their theology. The fact is, he has progressed, at least publicly, uh, from, I would say, a, a centrist or uh, an, an evangelical, you know, 10 or 12 years ago, to uh, an outright liberal today. Um, I suspect that he has been this way for a long time. He uh, had, I think, a liberal uh, Bible education um, and that sort of thing. In fact, when he was hired at uh, uh, Mars Hill, uh, the, the senior pastor acknowledged to the elder board that uh, he didn't think Bell really knew his Bible very well, but he communicated very well. And there you see... And they, and they still hired him? They did. And, and there you see the chief flaw with how uh, a lot of, you know, these mega pastors are, are elevated today to, to where they are. Uh, it's all about uh, style over substance. It's about how effective they are at communicating. Uh, and, you know, frankly, when Bell's NEMA videos came out uh, 10 years ago or so, I thought, the first one I saw, I thought, wow, this guy is great. I mean, he's, he's teaching biblical truths in a, in a new way, 10, 12-minute videos. Uh, but then when I, I got into his his worldview, I became really disturbed. And um, and so he's progressed now to a point where, uh, as you say, he really is a universalist. That's the message he wants to impart to, uh, in particular, the, the millennial generation, the younger evangelicals. And, and unfortunately, I think he's had a lot of success. Um, he's gotten some, some press lately with... Uh, also affirming other anti-biblical positions, but I, I think that his universalism uh, is the chief problem right now. You know, uh, Jim, I, it, I am troubled by the impact that Rob Bell has had on younger Christians. Uh, in a personal uh, note, uh, my daughter Carissa told me, I'm, I'm not going to say the young man's name, uh, he's, he's a pastor in Maryland where where I I uh, used to live where I grew up, and um, his father uh, was a pastor also. And uh, I was uh, I was an elder in the church that his father pastored. So I, you know, I knew the son when he was in high school. And my daughter told me uh, a few months ago she was just shocked <laughs> to find out that the son who is now pastoring a church has embraced the Rob Bell theology, and was communicating with my daughter that he no longer believes in in hell. And I you know Jim, Jim it was it was just so hard for me to believe. So wait a minute. I know I remember this pastor's son. I watched him go through high school, watched him grow up. What happened along the way? He's now pastoring a church and he's telling his congregation, "I don't believe there is a hell." And it's, and he came to that conclusion after reading Rob Bell's book. Well, uh, yeah, and you open up a really fascinating uh, line of conversation. I'll have two quick uh, responses. The first is um, someone should really do a study of the sons of fathers in ministry in the United States because the fathers are still orthodox, uh, you know, relatively traditional in their uh, uh, method of, of preaching and that sort of thing, but, but many of the sons have gone hard to the left. And I mean, you could name John so Os John Osteen, Joe Absolutely. Osteen. John Absolutely. Osteen was a fantastic pastor yes. and preacher, strong yes. man of God. His son yes. is like living on another planet. Well, he, he is, and and that's the second part of my answer. And I think that you could uh, you could fairly uh, well say with authority that the reason, or one of the primary reasons that this has happened, is because. What we've had for a hundred years in this country is liberal scholarship in the seminaries, but that's where it stayed until, I would say, 20 years ago or so. They taught it there, it incubated there, they actually taught 
the, the, the young men they were grooming as pastors not to reveal their liberal theology to the congregations. It's just that now, especially in the last 10 years, the culture has progressed to the point that they're comfortable now coming out, so to speak, with liberal theology. And that's why you see so many of the younger uh, ministers, the, uh, the second generation guys who are now comfortable coming out with that sort of thing. Um, in, in the book, uh, Truth Wins, I point out uh, what I think is a fascinating parallel, and that is that if you read what uh, Henry Ward Beecher said in the late 19th century, and I think Beecher was probably the Billy Graham of his day, he was probably America's pastor in the late 19th century in this country, Beecher, uh, for example, on the subject of hell, he said, you know, I, I really want to emphasize the grace in, in the Bible. I, I want to emphasize the love of God. I don't want to emphasize the judgmental, the wrath of God. And so Beecher threw out uh, any, any discussion of hell being a real place. And if you read his sermons and you read what Bell writes, it's, it's almost as if Bell is committing plagiarism. It's, it's almost word for word the same kind of thought. So, again, we have this progression where now the Rob Bells in this country feel very comfortable uh, coming out into the open about their liberal theology. And, and to be perfectly honest, I don't see any accountability. I don't see other evangelical leaders calling them on it. I know. That's what troubles me. They're getting away with it, and, and nobody nobody is challenging these guys and saying, this is heresy that you're preaching. Well, you know, the uh, the church growth movement, has become so powerful uh, that they they really all march in lockstep with the, you know it's called consensus building um, and part of uh, part of that community uh, part of the the criteria is that you don't criticize other ministry leaders and so we have a severe lack of warning in the pulpits um, not just about political issues going on in this country but also theological issues, and so the people don't know. They're not given information by these pastors, and I, frankly, I think as the, the church growth movement continues to mushroom, it'll get even worse. The last well-known pastor who went down the road of universalism was Carlton Pearson yes. of, of Tulsa, Oklahoma. Mm-hmm. And uh, I was really shocked when he did it, uh, and, you know, he was a graduate of Oral Roberts University and was uh, traveling in that, uh, in that uh, sphere of, of, of influence out of Tulsa. Uh, but he just, he just completely went off the rails. And, uh, you know, when you listen to Carlton, because I like the guy, you know, and, mm-hmm. and, and he's a fantastic singer. I mean, the boy can sing, and, and uh, I really miss hearing him sing. And when you'd listen to Carlton, he, you know, he had he had such a genuine sincerity about him. I mean, I, you know, I don't think the man was trying to deceive anybody. I think he truly believed what he was what he was preaching. Um, but he was the last person that of any notoriety that that went down this road of universalism until Rob Bell came along. But but Carlton Pearson did not have the impact on others that Rob Bell had. And and let's say this in defense of the late Oral Roberts. Uh, Oral Roberts immediately severed his relationship with Carlton Pearson. Yes, he he did exhibit discipline and removed him. I think I think Carlton Pearson was on the board of directors of ORU, if I recall. I mean, uh, you know, Oral Roberts did take action and say, "I can't, I can't overlook it. This is this is too deep." Of 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 a departure from the faith, and, and so Carlton Pearson uh, was was uh, ostracized from that circle that he was traveling in. But with Ron Bell, it's the opposite. He's been embraced. Well, he has been embraced, and I think that you you put your finger on a, another uh, big reason why a lot of the older traditional ministry leaders are now passing from the scene, and they're simply literally not there anymore to call these guys to account. 
And the result is uh, what I mentioned a minute ago: this complete lack of accountability. Um, the you know the the new progressive uh, megachurch pastor. Uh, a lot of them are all about personal branding, marketing, building their brand. Uh, they they need to go to a centrist position in order to bring as many people into the fold as possible. And so that's one of the reasons, too, that you're seeing a softening on positions that, that were always biblical, uh, always based on a biblical worldview. Now you have to appeal to the greatest audience, and the way to do that, of course, is to soften your positions on, on the Bible. Mm-hmm. Now, Jim, um, what you just said, that a lot of the, the mega pastors are all about uh, building and, and enhancing and protecting their brand and their image – some of our listeners may not know exactly what you're referring to. I, I do because my my professional background before entering full time ministry was was uh, marketing, and I worked for several television networks as marketing uh, as a marketing director. Uh, I am I am aware I know for a fact that that some of the biggest ministries in the land retain secular marketing professionals to advise the minister how to tweak and craft his public image, what topics to speak on, what topics to avoid. And uh, this is probably shocking to a lot of people, but you need to understand, folks, that some of these really big-name preachers that you see on TV or hear on the radio are being advised like uh, the same way a, a corporation would be advised on on um, marketing their product or their service, and because this is mega money. We're talking we're talking ministries that bring in one hundred to two hundred million dollars a year in donations, plus that you know that you know maybe a similar amount in in book sales and and DVD sales and product sales. This is huge business. And we're talking about, and these guys get advice on their image. And well, you know what, Jim? Hell doesn't sell right now, does it? You know, you're exactly correct again. And it is shocking to traditional uh, rank-and-file Christians in the pews. They do sense, the, the older generation sense that something is amiss. They sense that something is wrong, but they can't quite put their finger on it. But what you... What you just mentioned is is a big part of this, and I I came out of the Christian book publishing industry, so I also understand some about the marketing angle. And the fact is that a lot of these guys are set up, uh, basically handed the infrastructure to a giant ministry. They're they're selected because of their communication skills. Uh, they then receive large book contracts with major publishers. Uh, they are absolutely coached. Uh, in detail on how to market their books and things like that. I I just read uh, the other day a blog post by actually an atheist who visited one of these mega churches, and he said that he stopped by the restroom and there were posters advertising the pastor's books in the restroom. Uh, That's really not an extreme example anymore. I mean, the product that they produce, DVDs, DVDs, Books, podcasts, the conferences. If you'll notice, there is a, a, an avalanche of these conferences that these guys organize. They all run in the same circles, and there's big money in all this. Um, and so the the fact is, a lot of these guys have found a very lucrative channel, and they the the emphasis then becomes on building a bigger and bigger brand. Jim, uh, earlier this week. Uh, the former president of Poland, Lech Walesa, uh, gave a speech before a, a summit of uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners. And he said, we, we must have a new Ten Commandments. We must have a set of universal values that can be embraced by all the religions of the world. And what I see in people like Rob Bell is that they are the forerunners inside the evangelical Christian uh, community to prepare the people to accept this global, universal set of Ten Commandments that will have nothing to do with the Word of God. Well, absolutely, and, and I'll, I'll say this. I'm utterly convinced 
that within a fairly short period of time, you'll see a lot of the most famous evangelical ministry leaders in this country uh, in, embracing that kind of oneness. Uh, I think that they're, they're telegraphing right now which direction they're going. Um, even the old denominations that were conservative now have leadership that are signaling that they are, are now, quote, centrist um, on their way to liberalism. And so uh, you can just track where they're going. And the fact is, in a few short years, I don't think people in this country will any longer recognize the evangelical church. It'll be so changed. I agree. It's, it, uh, the transformation is in motion right now. And uh, in this age of Barack Obama, uh, a an inclusive Christianity that that denies hell, that embraces homosexuality, embraces same sex marriage, embraces all of the the doctrines of the of the socialist movement under Barack Obama. This will become the norm in most evangelical churches. It, it will, and and here's how I answer people now who increasingly ask me about these issues, and I tell them that now you see the the most well-known evangelical ministry leaders uh, rushing to have photo ops with the president, things like that. A generation ago, that would never have happened. The the pastors would have held the line on a biblical worldview, but now what you have. You know, a generation, two generations ago, a well-known pastor in this country would have been 50 steps removed from a Rob Bell Association. Now, many of them are maybe one step removed. And what I mean by that is, they may not embrace yet Bell's um, aggressive uh, form of liberalism, but uh, one of their associates does. Like, for example, you'll notice on their websites, they're... Uh, they're promoting, uh, you know, one of his books or, or that sort of thing. That's how they're making an incremental progress to full-blown liberalism, uh, which will seem sudden to people, but actually it's just this progression of the last several years. I've noticed a huge change in only the last 10 years. Mm-hmm. And if you have to listen very carefully to what a lot of these mega pastors are actually saying. Because on the surface, it sounds so smooth. It sounds so wonderful. It just makes you have, you know, warm fuzzies all over when you listen to them. But you got to listen very carefully to what they say. I, I recall it's maybe been a year or two ago, Joe Osteen was on uh, CNN or one of the, the major news uh, programs. And the anchor man was drilling him on, and this may have been Larry King, I don't recall. Um, but they were asking him, about, you know, what about Muslims? Will they go to heaven? What about Jews? Will they go to heaven? What about, you know? And uh, you could see Joel Osteen, he was fidgeting in the seat. He was starting to get a little nervous and sweaty, and he was uh, uh, deflecting those questions. And I thought, well, you know, I'm just going to watch this. I want to see where he goes with this. You know, will he deny the faith now that he's under pressure on national TV? And the, the newsman said, um, do you have to believe in Jesus to go to heaven? And I thought, here's the moment. This is it. And Joel said, yes, you do. You have to believe in Jesus to uh, to meet God. He said, but there are many paths to Jesus. Yes, I heard it, Jim, with my own ears. I heard Joe Osteen say, there are many paths to Jesus. And I sat there looking at that television set, and I said, Joel, you know, I'm talking to the TV set. Joel, you know, the Bible I have all these years, I thought there was a, I thought there was just one, you know, straight and narrow path, and you had to go past the cross. That's what I was believing all this time. Now I find out from Joel Osteen, there are many paths to get to God through Jesus Christ. Absolutely. And, and, you know, um, Notice how Clintonian his phrasing was. He what what they do, and, I, and I, I'm convinced again that in the marketing of, the, of this kind of thing, they're they're actually coached. They are coached yes. by media people. And if you notice what he did there, he he attempted to cover all of his bases. If if he said yes, I believe it's through Jesus. 
then his followers would, would either stop listening or they'd shut off the TV or whatever, and they can say, look, Joel affirms a uh, biblical worldview uh, on, on Jesus, but, but as you said, listen to the rest of what he said, and, and it's nothing of the sort. And so he recognizes, I think, what he's doing, all these guys do. They, they, they parse things and they, they use uh, lawyer speak, to get across two or three points at the same time. And so it comes back to this double speak. They can say anything to anybody and leave the people satisfied. That's right. Um, that, that's a hallmark of, of, a, of a heretic. And, and yet, that method of communication is absolutely exploding in the evangelical church in this country. That's right. What Joel Osteen said that day was no different than what New Age uh, evangelist Oprah Winfrey promotes because that's what she's promoting. It's a new age religion that she's promoting on her TV show. You know, there, right. uh, Oprah will say, I believe in Jesus, but there are many ways to get to Jesus. Or there are many Jesus. You know, it's that inclusive theology that they promote. And it's dangerous. And it will send people to a literal hell where they will yep. spend eternity. Uh, Jim, I appreciate you uh, being on the program today. My guest, uh, Jim Fletcher, we'll have him back. Uh, In the future, we'll continue this conversation. He's the uh, founder of Prophecy Matters. The website is prophecymatters.com. And uh, his book is Truth Wins, a book about heaven, hell, and the dangerous theology of Rob Bell. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, Rick. Hey, I've got a minute or two uh, before we close. And I want to just say this. You know, uh, most of you know that I'm very confident that planet Earth is entering its next cooling cycle. Global warming is over. Global cooling is starting. Now, the sun and the Earth's climate moves in cycles, and there's nothing mysterious about it. Sunspots are currently at a 100-year low. Low sunspot activity means cooler temperatures on Earth. The big question is how long will the sunspot activity remain dormant? Now, 2013 was supposed to be the grand finale of sunspot cycle 23. turned out to be a big dud. Some scientists think there may not even be a cycle 24. If so, watch out. That means a mini ice age will be in motion. We could be looking into the face of a mini ice age that will last 40 years, 70 years, or even 200 years. Now, last spring and summer, I advised you to get prepared early for a long, bitterly cold, harsh, snowy winter. The Weather Channel reported today that, quote, This has already been a rather eventful October as far as winter storms are concerned. First, winter storm atlas, uh, excuse me, first buried parts of the northern uh, high plains of western Dakotas, Wyoming, and western Nebraska with heavy wet snow crippling travel and snapping trees and power lines. Uh, Then this week, several locations from Minnesota to Dayton, Ohio picked up snow. Uh, Now the last week of October holds the possibility of another winter storm. Sunday into Monday, an Arctic cold front will plunge southward from the Canadian Rockies and prairies into the northern Rockies and plains. Um, Strong north to northeast winds may lead to blizzard conditions in Montana, Idaho, and Wyoming. By Tuesday, snow will be spreading into Utah, Colorado, and Nevada including Montana, Wyoming, Idaho, and the Dakotas. Now listen to this. Uh, Surges of cold air are plunging into the central and eastern states this week as the jet stream dominates to the east of the Rockies. The surge of cold air have dropped temperatures up to 20 degrees below average from the Midwest to much of the East Coast. Locations from Springfield, uh, Missouri, to Lexington, Kentucky... The Carolinas, Alabama, Tennessee will be in the 20s by Friday night. My friends, get ready. Coffee. Coffee now!